Book Three, Chapter Four of Gloriana, or the Revolution of Nineteen Hundred, by Lady Florence Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gloriana, or the Revolution of Nineteen Hundred, Book Three, Chapter Four. Peace after the storm. I, in so far that the tempest fiend has vanished, leaving behind him only the low moan of the dying gale. High above the heights which look down on island Finnan, Teoran's ruins and the lovely woods of Shona's Isle, hover the cloud mists of rising morn, through whose seemingly tissue veil glint and gleam the joyous sparks, fantastic offspring of the newborn sun. Its light, too, was warming those heights with a rosy glow, and the thick dark woods are pierced with its golden shafts. Like myriad diamonds sparkle the raindrops on the pines and the dew on the glades and fairy rings where elfin goblins have held their midnight orgies. Yet the gale has left its afterbirth in the rolling swell, which beats in relentless fury on the rock-girt coast of Shona's Isle, and lashes the sandy stretch of beach between Arto and Rue Drimich. High tide is rising on those shores, an inland current has set in and in its grasp are the trophies of the storm-fiend's victory over the handiwork of man. What are these trophies? Why, here and there a spar, a tossing barrel, a broken oar. There is something floating, too, on the heaving swell with which the waves are making merry, for they carry it to the sandy beach and drag it back again, toss it still further inland, and smother it in their spray. It is a choice plaything. The salt sea waves are battling for it hard, but the tide and the inland current say them nay, and the sandy beach gives it a rugged welcome. There for a time it may rest. It! But what may it be? A human body, surely. Out in the bay the yacht Eileen is coasting up and down. Eager eyes are scanning the waste of water, and every sign of wreckage is minutely observed. Ever and anon the voices of the men aloft shout down some new discovery to the anxious watchers on the deck below. There is a look of intense agony in the eyes of the young Duke of Ravensdale as he paces that snow-white deck. His features are drawn and haggard, his cheeks are deathly pale, and the lines of care have seared their mark indelibly across his high and noble brow. "'Wreckage ahoy!' The men on the lookout have spied another victim of the gale which the inland current is drawing to Ardamurkin's shores. What can it be? It looks like the back of a whale, or a huge porpoise turning over in its course. What can it be? The Eileen steams towards it, and comes close up alongside it. No, it is no whale. Only the remnant of a fishing smack, part of which appears to have been bodily severed from the hole. The sharp order to man the lifeboat cutter is given. In a few minutes it is riding the heaving swell. All eyes are occupied with this new discovery. Even the lookout men have forgotten their duty aloft. Suddenly, however, Flora Desmond's voice rings out. She has been keeping silent, faithful watch by Evie Ravensdale. "'What's that?' she cries. In a moment he is straining with an eager, hungry look those wild, despairing eyes. She is pointing away to starboard, and he sees, unmistakably sees, a human head and shoulders rising up and down on the grey ocean surface. With a low cry he springs forward. Were it not for Flora's restraining clutch, he would be overboard and swimming to meet it. "'Wait, Evie,' she says imploringly. "'The boat will fetch it in a moment. Don't go, Evie. Alas, it is not she. She has a clear sight, has Flora Desmond. She has caught a glimpse of the dead white face thrown back as it rises on the crest of the heaving swell, and she knows that it is not the face of Gloria Delara. But when the lifeboat cutter retrieves the body, and it is hoisted on to the deck, then indeed Flora cannot restrain a cry of horror as she recognizes in the set, rigid face, wide open, staring eyes, and close clenched teeth, the unmistakable features of the girl traitoress, the female Judas Leone. Take her from my sight! Oh, God, take her away! burst from the pale lips of Evie Ravensdale, 
as in a moment the sight of the body before him drives from his heart the clinging hope that Gloria is not dead. He knows now that the storm-fiend has claimed her for his victim, that on this earth the dark blue eyes will never look their love again. As they bear Leone from his sight, an unnatural calmness seizes him. He turns to Flora. We must do our duty, Flora. Mine is to see you safe. We will put the helm about and steer for the great free land. And when we get there, Flora, you will see her mother and break it to her, won't you?" His words are so cold and measured, his face so unmoved, that Flora is half fearful for his reason. She lays her hand gently on his arm. Not yet, Evie. We must put back to Shona first. We must not give up the search yet. I mean to examine the whole coastline between this and Rue Dwimwich. But she is dead, Flora. Don't you know she is dead? he says coldly. Still, Evie, we may find her dear body. Oh, no, Evie, we must not give up the search. We must seek on, answers Flora. She dare not buoy him up with the fresh hope that Gloria may be alive. The sight of Leone has told her this cannot be. Yet still she is resolved more than ever to search on for the body of her friend. The boatswain is standing near. She sends him with instructions to the captain to put the yacht's head about and run for Moidert's lock, and then she resumes her watch by Evie Ravensdale. Time flies, but he does not notice her. His eyes are staring out over the ocean wave. As they near the lock, Nigel Escort comes up. A moment, Flora, he says, motioning her to come apart. The doctor is trying to bring Leone round. He says life is not extinct. If he can only succeed, we may be able to extract from her what has happened. Will you go and see her? I will keep Ravensdale company while you go down." "'You must be very gentle, Estcourt. You must watch him closely, too. I am terribly afraid for his reason. He seems turned to stone since he set eyes on Leone. It is a bad sign. If tears would come, they would relieve him. Ah, God help him! It is terrible." She sighs deeply as she turns from him. Heavy at heart, yet is Flora's heart heavier still when it thinks of the agony which Evie Ravensdale is suffering. What would she not endure to bring comfort and peace to his tortured soul? She makes her way down to the cabin where Leone is lying. The doctor, with the stewardess and her assistant, are busy treating her. He looks up hopefully as Flora enters. "'She has moved. She has struggled for breath,' he observes quickly. "'Lady Flora, she will live. She seems to me a mere child. I wonder who she is.' But Flora does not answer, only she moves over to the couch and looks down on the motionless girl. It is strange. But as she looks she sees the same remarkable resemblance in this girl to Bernie Fontenoy which Gloria had remarked the previous night. Certainly it is strange, very strange. There is a long-drawn sigh, and then a struggle for breath. Leone clutches the air with her hands and her lips move. "'I am stifling,' she gasps. "'Don't choke me! Don't! Please don't! Let me breathe! Please let me breathe!" The doctor raises her up slightly and again Leone sighs. Then she draws a long breath. "'I love you,' she says softly. "'I love you, Gloria. I love God, too. I wish I hadn't betrayed you now. But you have forgiven me. You have been kind to me. You have kissed me. Oh, those waves, those dreadful waves! They will kill you. You have given me the life-belt, and you have not got one. Take it off, Gloria. Put it on yourself and leave me. I don't mind drowning. I would like to drown for you. Let me kiss you first. Let me sleep now. Let me die." Her hitherto fixed and staring eyes shoot with a gleam of returning intelligence. She closes them, and her head falls forward. She will sleep now observes the doctor, as he lays her down and turns her on her side. And when she awakes she will be all right. 
a marvellous recovery. She must have wonderful vitality in her. We will leave her quiet now, Lady Flora. The yacht is in motion again. Do we continue the search? Yes, but along the coast. I must go now, doctor. You will let me know later how the patient is, won't you? Certainly, he answers cheerfully. Flora returns on deck. The Oni's words have puzzled her. They were clearly addressed to Gloria, and yet these disjointed utterances can convey but one interpretation of her fate. Gladly would Flora swallow a grain of hope, but she knows that it would only make the reality harder to bear, a reality which she has faced and accepted already. Gloria, she whispers, if you can hear me now, you will know how true was Flora's friendship. God help me, and I will clear your name of that foul charge laid to your door. Leone may know something of it, and she will tell me, for on the threshold of death has she not said that she loves you? Brave, noble Flora! Self is buried in those generous words. She never pauses to think of the danger in which she stands, or the trouble which she must suffer. But Flora is heroic. The yacht is gliding into moitered slock, and again the lifeboat cutter is manned and lowered. Flora has determined to search the whole shore within the radius of the drifting inland current, which long experience of these coasts has taught her draws wrecks there too. She will conduct the search in this direction herself, while, as is now arranged, Estcourt and Archie Douglasdale will prosecute it along Shona's rocky coast in the large gig. Archie had returned to Glenig Bay on the evening before, only to find the fishing box deserted, his sister, Ravensdale, and Estcourt gone. One of his trusty Ruglan retainers awaited him, however, with the information that they had crossed the hills by Kinloch Moitert for Eileen Shona, where the Duke's yacht lay anchored. The message which Leone had been entrusted to convey was to this very effect, the Duke having further commissioned her to apprise Gloria of his intended arrival alone from the Loch Eilert side. "'Evie,' says Gloria gently, "'will you come with me, will you not? I am going to search the sand-beaches in the cutter up to Rue Drimmich. Come, Evie.' He turns almost sullenly. God help him! The torture he is suffering is rid in his eyes. She is dead, is all he says. But he follows Flora nevertheless, and they enter the cutter together. Then he bows his face in his hands and remains silent. The search they make is thorough. How could it be else with Flora in command? And gradually the cutter creeps slowly on in the direction of the body on the shore. It is sighted at length. The lookout man utters his warning cry, and Flora stands suddenly up and stares eagerly ahead. Yes, there it lies, high and dry on the sandy beach. Undoubtedly a human form. "'Bend to your oars, lads!' she cries. "'I'm going to beach her!' And with that she brings the boat's nose sharply for the shore. "'Evie,' she says again, "'rouse yourself, Evie. We shall be in the breakers in a minute. There is a body on the beach." He looks up quickly. Just a gleam of hope is in his wild eyes, and he is thoroughly on the alert. The boat rushes forward. It rises high on the first breaker and is hurled towards the shore. True is the hand that holds the tiller and the nerve that guides it. Straight as a dart does Flora keep the cutter's nose, and her voice encourages the oarsmen to their duty. The seething foam half fills the boat but it gallantly rides the water still as another breaker bears it onward. Now the keel grates the sandy bottom. "'Ship oars, lads, and out of her!' Flora commands, but she sets the example too. She is in the water waist-high. In a moment the stalwart sailors have obeyed her. Rough, willing hands grasp the cutter's sides, and with combined force to the seaman's cheery, "'Pull, boys, together!' run her high and dry on to the beach. But Evie Ravensdale has rushed forward. Hope still surges in his heart. The body is stretched out upon the sand, the figure is lying on its face, the hands are clenched. It is easy, however, to see that the body is not that of a woman. It is plain as plain can be that it is a man. 
He sees this at once and turns away with a bitter, despairing cry. It was a mad, vain hope to have indulged in, and yet in his breaking heart Evie Ravensdale had prayed to be allowed to look upon her face once more, ay, even though it were in death. An exclamation from Flora for a moment attracts him. She has followed him and has turned the body over. Evie! she cries, and there is a passionate ring of triumph in her voice. Though Gloria be dead, her pure, fair fame is saved. Though God has taken her, he has dashed to the ground the foul lie with which they sought to doom her. Look, Evie, look! Her noble name is cleared! With a startled, eager look, he comes to her side. He sees at his feet the pallid, upturned face of a dead man. This man has dark hair, and a dark, thick beard, mustache and whiskers, in which gray hairs are stealing fast. This man has dark eyes, but the luster of life has left them, and his white teeth are clenched together with a horrid grin. He stares down at the corpse below him. The wild, hungry look in his beautiful eyes is dying now. Triumph and exultation are there. "'Gloria!' he cries. "'My darling, you have triumphed! They thought they could kill you with a false and awful lie. There's your answer. Nor shall your great cause die. I swear to win it for you. I swear. I swear it now!' He turns away with a gasping sob but Flora has no longer any fear for him. Evie Ravensdale vow will bid him live, live on for Gloria's sake. Calmly and quietly she turns to the sailors. "'We will carry that body to Dorlin, my lads. Guard it well. There lies the man whom a too confident jury declared to be dead, for whose murder the noblest of women was unjustly condemned. That corpse is Lord Westray.' End of Book 3, Chapter 4《Book 3, Chapter 5 of • Gloriana, or The Revolution of 1900, by Lady Florence Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. • Gloriana, or The Revolution of 1900, Book 3, Chapter 5 the blinds are drawn down in the single window of a small bedroom that overlooks a narrow, dull and dingy street, not far removed from Trafalgar Square. The room, though clean, bears a poverty-stricken look, for in it, in addition to the bed, there are only two chairs, an old table, and a dilapidated sofa with a thin rug covering it. There is a small wash-hand stand in this room besides the other articles named, but this is all. Lying on the bed is a large-eyed, pale, emaciated young man, upon whose face is unmistakably written the sign of death. His thin hands, in which the blue veins show prominently clear, lie listlessly on the coverlet, though now and again the feeble fingers twitch nervously thereat, and a hectic flush covers his pale cheeks. His large hollow eyes have a brilliant, shining look in them, and they appear to be fixed on the door of the room which stands slightly ajar. There is a sound of the street door downstairs opening, and the movement of several feet. The young man raises himself up and listens eagerly, but the exertion is too much for him, and he sinks back with a heavy sigh. The footsteps he has heard are ascending the staircase, however, and his eyes devour the door more eagerly than before. It opens and admits a young girl a girl who would decidedly be called pretty were it not for the pinched, careworn look that rules in her regular and well-cut features. She bears a great resemblance to the invalid whom we have been describing. This is not to be wondered at, seeing she is his twin sister. "'Maggie!' he exclaims in a low voice as she enters. "'Have you brought him?' "'Yes, Eric,' she answers at once as she comes to his bedside and puts the old faded coverlet at which his fingers have been twitching smooth and tidy. "'Where is he?' again asked the brother in the same low voice. "'Downstairs, Eric. I'll fetch him up. He's brought another gentleman with him. He calls him a magistrate, I think. "'He said this gentleman must take your deposition, because he couldn't,' said Maggie as she opens the door. 
The next minute she is running down the somewhat rickety staircase. Two gentlemen are standing in the passage below. "'This way, please, sirs,' she says politely, and they follow up behind her to Eric Fortescue's room. The two gentlemen are Colonel Francis Barrett, Divisional Magistrate, and Evie, Duke of Ravensdale. Eric Fortescue fixes his eyes on the latter, whom he knows well by sight. He has seen him often before with Hector de Strange. "'You wish to see me, my lad?' inquires the Duke in a kind but sad voice. "'Your sister tells me you have something particular to say to me?' "'Yes,' answers the sick youth, in his low, feeble voice. "'And I want you, sir, to take down what I say, and hear me swear it's all true. I want to tell you quick, sir, because I'm dying. I can't last long." There is a sob over by the window. Maggie is looking out into the miserable street with her forehead pressed against one of its cracked panes. "'Say all you have to say very slowly to this gentleman, then, my lad,' answers Evie Ravensdale. "'He is a magistrate, and will take your deposition, and hear you swear to it.' I want to tell you, sir, how wicked I have been. But God has forgiven me, for Father Vaughan has heard my confession and given me absolution. I'm a Catholic, sir, you know. But Father Vaughan told me I ought to tell you what I'm going to, because of the great wrong which other people have suffered by what I've helped to do. So, sir, this is it. I'm twenty-three years of age, sir, and have earned my living since a boy and since poor mother died in the service of Mr. Trackham. He's a private detective agent, sir, and something else besides. He always said I was a sharp lad, and that I did things quick for him, so that when I was eighteen he made me his head clerk, and used to tell me all about his affairs and jobs. It was he and I who arranged that attack on Mrs. Delara, and several days before it I had watched her every night when she came out for her evening stroll, and the night before the attack I got into her sitting-room while she was out, and stole a lot of her note-paper and some of her writing. I was at Mr. De Strange's trial, sir, and all what Mrs. Delara and Miss Vernon and you swore to was quite true, and nearly all what Mr. Trackham said was a lie. Well, sir, after Mr. De Strange and you and Miss Vernon rescued Mrs. Delara, Mr. Trackham and I and Lord Westray held a consultation. His lordship was very much put about, and swore he would be revenged. He offered me and Mr. Trackham a deal of money to help him. And then Mr. Trackham hatched the plan, sir. I can imitate handwriting well, and he made me write two letters, copying Mrs. Delara's handwriting. One was to her maid, saying she was going up to London, and the other to Mr. Trackham telling him to keep the house in Verdigris Crescent for her and Lord Westray. And then Lord Westray himself wrote several letters in the vein described by Mr. Trackham at the trial. And then, sir, Mr. Trackham arranged with his lordship all about buying a poor man's body as soon as one could be found suitable for the purpose. You look startled, sir, but it's not difficult to do a job of that sort in some parts of London, and, in fact, one was soon got. We put Lord Westray's gold ring on one of its little fingers, and hung the chain and locket about its neck, and it was me, sir, that took it down by night and buried it in Mrs. Delara's grounds where it was found. And close to it I buried the clothes which Lord Westray was wearing the night that Mr. De Strange fired at him. By this time Lord Westray had gone abroad, but it was all arranged that in two years' time or so Mr. De Strange was to be accused of the murder. When that time had elapsed, anonymous letters were sent to the present Lord Westray, telling him all about the murder, and then Mr. Trackham went and told his lordship what he knew. Everything happened as we wanted it to. The matter was placed in Mr. Trackham's hands. He communicated with the police, and he employed me and a dog of his called Nero, a half-bred bloodhound, to hunt the grounds of Mrs. Delara's place at night in search of the body in clothes. I had previously given Nero a lesson or two as to their whereabouts, so he soon traced them in the presence of the police. This is all I know, sir. On my dying oath I swear that Mr. De Strange did not murder Lord Westray. 
the wound received was slight and soon healed up. This is my confession, sir. I know I did wrong, and I was a poor boy, and was sorely tempted by the money offered me. I loved a girl, sir. She was called Leone, and she was in Mr. Trackham's service. I wanted to marry her, and I didn't dare ask for her till I got money. But God has punished me. I shall never see Leone again. She has gone away, and I don't know where, and now I'm dying. If it had not been for dear sister Maggie, I should have been dead by now, for Lord Westray never paid me the money he promised to. Least he ever gave it to Mr. Trackham, I never got it. Not that I want it now. I would not touch it for all the world. Indeed, I would not. And now, sir, I want to ask you to forgive me as I know God has, and I want you to ask Mrs. Delara and Mr. Destrange to forgive me too. I think if they saw me as you do now, sir, they would pity and forgive me." The young man pauses and listens eagerly for a reply. The hectic flush has deepened in his cheeks, and his eyes gleam with the fire that heralds death more brilliantly than ever. "'My poor lad, I do forgive you, as I hope to be forgiven myself,' says Evie Ravensdale softly. Terrible and horrible as is the plot which this dying youth has disclosed to him, yet in the presence of that death which he can see approaching fast he feels that he must forgive. "'And Mrs. Delara, Mr. Destrange?' persists Eric Fortescue anxiously. "'Mr. Destrange is dead,' is all that Evie Ravensdale can trust himself to reply. Eric Fortescue starts up in his bed and stares wildly at the Duke. Not hang, sir! Oh, God! Not hang, sir! I thought he escaped, sir!" A hollow racking cough seizes him. The blood dyes his lips as he falls back helplessly as before. In a moment Maggie is by his side with her left arm tenderly round him, and supporting him in a sitting position, as she wipes the blood from his lips with an old handkerchief. "'Have you anything, my girl, to moisten his lips with?' inquires the duke, horrified at the sight before him. "'No, sir,' she answers in a low, hopeless voice. "'He had his last orange yesterday, and I have not a penny left except enough for the rent. I dare use that. They would turn us out if that was not paid punctual.' Evie Ravensdale shudders. Words would not paint his feelings. "'Here, Maggie,' he says, "'here's some money.' Run, my girl, and buy what you think he will fancy, and we will stay with him until you return. At least, Colonel, I won't ask you to. I know your time is precious. Will you swear this lad, and let him sign that deposition, and then I won't keep you? But I want to stay myself and see him comfortable before I leave." With a happy smile lighting up her face, Maggie Fortescue hurries from the room, and then Eric swears to and signs the deposition. The signature is tremblingly and weakly penned, still there it is, a living witness to the truth of Speranza and Gloria Dolores' innocence. These formalities completed, Colonel Barrett takes his departure with the precious document in his safe-keeping. Its contents will ring through the world before another sun is down. No sooner has he gone than Eric Fortescue turns his eyes once more on the Duke. "'I'm glad he's gone, sir he says slowly, and speaking with difficulty. "'Because I want to tell you one more thing very particular, sir. It will be my last words, I think, for I feel I'm sinking. It's about Leone, sir. I want to tell you who she is, sir. Mr. Trackham told me, sir, long ago. Her mother was Nell Stanley. Of course you know who I mean, sir the big beauty whom your father, sir, took away from Lord Bolidown. It was she they fought that duel over. Well, Leone is Nell Stanley's child, and her father was the late Duke of Ravensdale. He treated her mother very bad, poor thing, and forsook her altogether after she got disfigured with the smallpox. She came to live in Verdigris Crescent and earn her living on the streets but she did not live long and died at Mr. Trackham's house when Leone was three years old. Mr. Trackham was beginning detective business then. Leone was so pretty and so smart 
that he kept her and trained her to the work, and that's how I came to know her, sir. And I did love her, and it was my love which tempted me to do all the wicked things I did. But God has punished me, sir. I am dying. I shall never see Leone any more. Still, I should be happy if I knew you would care for her, sir. He says the last words in a whisper. He has used all the strength that he possesses to make this last statement. Poor Eric Fortescue, it is his last. Maggie's footstep is on the stairs. She is coming up so quickly. She has brought some grapes, amongst other things, with the Duke's gift. "'Look, Eric, dear,' she exclaims as she hurries in and holds up a big bunch of fine black grapes for him to view. "'Look what I've got you!' But Eric's eyes are closed, and the hectic flush has given way to a deathly pallor. He has made his last effort on this earth. She sets the things down on the rickety table with a low cry and comes over to the bedside. "'Eric!' she pleads. "'Look at Maggie, Eric, poor Maggie. She's brought you such nice things.' He opens his big eyes. The brilliant gleam in them has died out. There is a dead, heavy, vacant look in them. "'I'm going, Maggie,' she hears him mutter. "'Tell Father Vaughn I did tell all. "'There's Mother Maggie. How pretty she looks. "'She's in a garden full of flowers and fruits and pretty things. "'The sun is so bright and the air so pure. "'And there's Leone, dear, pretty little Leone. "'Don't hold me, Maggie. I must go to her. I must.' And Maggie, bending over her twin brother, hears his voice grow still, feels on her cheek the last breath of life that goes forth with these words, for Eric Fortescue is dead. Poor Maggie! She is weak and ill and suffering. For weeks she has worked hard to support her brother, and watched by his bedside in her spare hours. She has stinted herself of food to buy him little delicacies. But of late work has been hard to get and during the last week she has obtained but scant employment, barely sufficient to buy bread with. At this moment food has not passed her lips for thirty-six hours, and the last bite she had was a few crusts soaked in water, the remnants of some bread from the crumb of which she had made her brother a little bread and milk. Poor Maggie! It is well. He wants no bread and milk now. But she does not cry or sob when she knows it is all over. She merely closes the dull, staring, lusterless eyes, smooths the worn coverlet once more, joins his hands as if in prayer, and drawing a small crucifix from her chest, kisses it and places it between his thin white fingers. Then she turns to Evie Ravensdale. "'He is dead, Your Grace,' she says meekly. "'It is God's will. I will never forget your kindness in forgiving him. Poor Eric! He was a good lad if he had not been led astray. Can I fetch you a cab, Your Grace?" Her voice is quiet, almost matter-of-fact, and yet Maggie Fortescue is alone in the world, hungry, tired, weary, and penniless. "'No, Maggie,' he says gently, "'certainly not. I am going away now, but I will send someone to help you. And when you have buried your poor brother, you must come to this address and let me know. I have several things to ask you, and you must let me help you to earn a comfortable living." "'God bless your grace,' she answers in a low voice. Then, as Evie Ravensdale turns to go, she holds out some silver to him, saying as she does so, "'It's the change, your grace, out of what you gave me to get those things for Eric.' "'Keep it, keep it, Maggie,' he says huskily and then he turns and leaves the poor, scantily furnished room in which he has learned so much, and in which he has established absolutely and completely the innocence of the woman whose lost image is ever before his eyes. End of Book Three, Chapter Five Book Three, Chapter Six of Gloriana, or The Revolution of 1900 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gloriana, 
or The Revolution of 1900. Book Three, Chapter Six. And while Eric Fortescue unburdens his soul of the heavy sin that has stained it, and bears it, purified and triumphant, through the portals of a new life, there is confusion and rage in the heart of Mr. Trackham as he sits at his business table hastily examining papers and committing them to the safe keeping of a large fire which consumes each consignment as it is thrown in. Mr. Trackham's usually confident and satisfied expression has given place to one of anxiety and fear. That he is disturbed is evident. "'Curse the fellow!' he keeps muttering to himself, and then a gleam of baffled rage shoots from his cunning eyes. There comes a knock at the door, a peculiar knock. He is evidently acquainted with it, for he looks up eagerly and calls out, Come in!" A woman enters obedient to the summons. She is a woman with a plump, artificial-looking figure, her hair is yellow, and her eyes, eyelashes and eyebrows are dark. An unmistakable sign of powder and rouge affords to her cheeks an appearance of pinkness, which all women who decorate themselves in this manner verily believe looks natural and becoming. Alas, if they could only see themselves as others see them! She is overdressed, is this woman, with plenty of rings on her fingers and jewelry about her, and her whole air unmistakably stamps her for what she is. "'Well?' inquires Mr. Trackham, in an impatient voice, as she comes in. "'How you dawdle, Victoire! Were they there?' "'Yes,' she replies at once. "'I saw the Duke and a strange gentleman and the girl Maggie all go into the house.' "'Did you follow and hear what Eric said?' again asks Mr. Trackham. He never stops the work upon which he is engaged, in spite of his anxiety to hear what she has to say. "'How could I?' she answers peevishly. "'I'm not a fairy who can become invisible at will. I saw them go in, that's all, and then I hurried back here.' "'Curse him!' is all Mr. Trackham vouchsafes in reply, but he works away harder than ever. Hanging over the back of a chair close to his table is a greatcoat, and on the seat lies a pot-hat, pair of gloves and walking-stick. On the ground below the chair stands a small black business bag. Into this bag Mr. Trackham ever and anon commits a paper from out the heap that he is destroying. There is a long pause. Then Victoire speaks. "'What are you going to do? I suppose you won't be safe here now?' she inquires. "'Safe!' He laughs angrily. Rather not. I suppose I'll have the bloodhounds on me before an hour's out. No, Victoire, I must cut it. And what's to become of me? she asks, somewhat aghast. You'll leave me some money, Trackham, and let me know where you're going to. Money! I've deuce a little left of that now. And as for telling you where I'm going to, I'm not such a fool. Why, you blurt it out any moment and Mr. Trackham laughs sneeringly. "'But what's to become of me?' she again inquires. "'Damned if I know,' he replies impatiently. "'I don't suppose you'll have much trouble in making a living, along with someone else, same way as you've made it here. You don't suppose I can saddle myself with you now and drag you about wherever I go? What a fool you are, Victoire!' "'Then you are going to throw me up?' she asks in a low voice. "'Haven't I told you I can't drag you about all over the place?' he answers savagely. "'But you'll leave me a little money, won't you?' she says with a half-sob. "'I haven't got a farthing, Trackham.' "'Then you must go and make it, my girl,' he replies coarsely. "'You'll have no difficulty in doing that, and I've no money to give you.' You know perfectly well that I've nigh ruined myself with lending all the money that I did to that Lord Westray, and now he's dead and I can't get it back. Curse him! I wish I'd never seen him, or had anything to do with that Mrs. Delara and her daughter. They beat us fair and square, Victoire, even though the daughter be dead. Fair and square. I hate them both, she burst out with unreasoning fury. They are the cause of my misery now. Oh, Trackham, don't forsake me. I might have made a comfortable, respectable home with Charles, but I threw it up to be with you. What did I do it for but because I loved you? I'm a bad one, no doubt, 
But at least I loved you, and do love you still. Don't forsake me. I'll stop here and put the trackers off the scent, and do all I know how to help you. Only promise me you let me know where you are by and by, and let me join you again." A brilliant thought strikes Mr. Trackham. He has not the slightest intention of doing as she asks, but it will be just as well, he thinks, to lead her to believe that he will, and meantime she may be useful in assisting his escape. "'Well, Victoire,' he says in a more conciliatory voice, "'you're a good girl, and a faithful one. Look here, here's five pounds, and I'll send you more soon. Stay here as long as you can, and keep the bloodhounds at bay. If the stuff get uneasy, you can hoodwink them. When you change your address, put it in the Times. And now, my girl, give us a kiss. I must be off. Every moment makes it more risky." He has finished burning his compromising papers, has taken up his hat, stick, and gloves, thrown his coat over one arm, and picked up the business bag. He is quite ready to go. She throws her arms round his neck. Fallen, degraded, wicked, as is Victoire Hester, yet she loves this vile, scheming, and contemptible wretch, for whose sake she has steeped her soul in the inky dye of sin, and turned from the path of honour and of truth. "'There now, there now, that's enough, old girl,' he says hastily, and as she unclasps her hands from about his neck, he steps quickly towards the door and opens it. "'Remember, Victoire, you balk the trackers,' he says significantly, and then he passes out from her presence and is gone. She hears the front door open and shut again, and springs to the window. She can just catch sight of him as he passes along the crescent. It is her last glimpse, and in spite of his promise to the contrary, she feels that it is. But Victoire Hester for the moment forgets herself. In the presence of the danger which threatens the man she loves, she becomes calm. All trace of his hasty departure must be quickly obliterated. She feels that this is imperatively necessary. Quickly she sets to work, tidies up his table, sets the room neat, and with her own hands collects the burnt paper and carries it off. Then she opens the windows to let out the smell which the burning paper has emitted, heaps more coals on the fire, and moves into Mr. Trackham's bedroom to arrange his things. In less than an hour all is shipshape and tidy as usual. There is not a sign of hasty departure. A few hours later there comes a ring at the front door. Victoire has given instructions that she will see anyone that calls. She has often before undertaken this duty in Mr. Trackham's absence, and the servant sees nothing strange in the order. He therefore admits the newcomers and shows them into Mr. Trackham's business room. These two newcomers are men. They are dressed in dark clothes, and they both seat themselves to await his coming. "'Run him in pretty sharp, eh?' observes one of them with a smile as the door closes on the servant. "'Haven't got him yet, Bush,' retorts the other quietly. Inspector Truffle is not of so sanguine a temperament as is Inspector Bush. "'As good as though,' replies Inspector Bush confidently, but he stops abruptly as he hears steps approaching. Again the door of Mr. Trackham's business room opens. Victoire enters. There is blank disappointment on Inspector Bush's face. Victoire sees it as she fixes her dark eyes full upon him. "'Good afternoon, gentlemen,' she says quietly. "'You wish to see Mr. Trackham? I'm sorry to say he is away, but I expect him back the day after tomorrow. His head clock is ill, too, but I can do anything for you in Mr. Trackham's place. I always attend to his affairs in his absence.' She smiles good-naturedly on the blank, nonplussed detectives. She seems to give her attention especially to Inspector Bush. Inspector Truffle rises to the occasion. "'Thank you, madam,' he says briskly, "'but I fear the business we have come about can only be transacted with Mr. Trackham. The fact is, madam, we came to settle an account that we owe him, and which would require Mr. Trackham's signature to be of any use as a receipt.' and the worst of it is we are going away and shall not be able to call again." He fixes a piercing glance upon her as he speaks, but Victoire is equal to the occasion. She does not believe a word of Inspector Truffle's statement, and divines perfectly well what his business is. She assumes a disappointed air as she exclaims, 
It is a great pity, but what is to be done? I do not think I can possibly get Mr. Trackham back before the day after tomorrow. However, I will telegraph to him and will send you his reply. Will you favor me with your address? Here is a poser. Victoire sees it and inwardly chuckles. But again Inspector Truffle attempts to uphold the fair fame of detective smartness. Certainly, madam, he replies as he takes out his card case and hands her a card therefrom, upon which she reads the address of a well known firm of solicitors. She assumes a most deferential manner. I think Mr. Trackham will make every effort to be here by tomorrow. I will telegraph at once, and unless you hear to the contrary, you will kindly call on Mr. Trackham at the same hour tomorrow, if you please, gentlemen." Mr. Truffle is triumphant. "'We will,' he answers. "'Well, thank you, madam. Good afternoon to you.' "'Good afternoon, gentlemen,' she replies with admirably feigned regret ringing in her voice. Inspectors Truffle and Bush betake themselves to the comfortable hansom that awaits them. As it rattles along, the former breaks the silence. "'We managed that capitally,' he says with a chuckle. "'Quite took her in. The chink of money soon made her open her ears. Bet you it brings Mr. Trackham home pretty quick.' "'Yes,' answers Inspector Bush. "'I didn't like the look of the woman when she first came in, but she took the bait readily enough. Poor things, those sort of women. No match for the likes of us, eh?' Inspector Truffle has had more experience than Inspector Bush and doesn't agree there, but he thinks, as he drives along, that anyhow this one is quite taken in. Is she, though? You'll find out your mistake, Inspector, when you call tomorrow with Inspector Bush at the same hour. End of Book Three, Chapter Six. Book Three, Chapter Seven of Gloriana, or the Revolution of Nineteen Hundred, by Lady Florence Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gloriana, or the Revolution of Nineteen Hundred, Book Three, Chapter Seven. The lights are low and softly subdued in Evie Ravensdale's private study or sanctum in Montragui House. The blinds and curtains are drawn. The fire casts its flickering shadows on the ceiling and walls, as ever and anon the little gas-jets from the coals shoot forth their vivid blaze, relapsing immediately after into smoke and gloom. The sounds of mimic warfare which they produce are the only ones which break the stillness prevailing, unless it be the low breathing of the dog Nero, which is stretched upon the hearth-rug. He would hardly, however, lie there so quietly and contentedly if he were the only occupant of the room, for a dog's chief characteristic is love of company, loneliness being his pet aversion. Nor is he alone, as we shall see if we glance at the big armchair drawn up in front of the fire, and looking again perceive that it is occupied. The figure which sits there is in truth very still and silent. It is laying back with its knees crossed and its arms resting on each side of the chair. Its head is slightly bent forward, and its dreamy eyes glitter in the firelight, which they are roving as if in search of an object prized but lost. What does Evie Ravensdale see in that flickering firelight which appears suddenly to arrest his gaze? It must be some cherished object indeed, judging by the happy smile which for a few brief moments lights up the otherwise sad face, on which melancholy has stamped its mournful features. That which he sees is but a passing vision, however, for the smile quickly dies away, and leaves the dark eyes searching again amidst the glowing coals, for the picture that has come and vanished. Above the fireplace, shrouded on either side by heavy curtains of old gold plush, hangs the oil-painting which represents his first meeting with Hector de Strange. It is only when alone that Evie Ravensdale draws those curtains aside, and then none can see the emotion which the picture arouses in him. For the memories which it awakens, albeit noble and tender, are painful, recalling, as they do, the image of her whom in life he has most cherished and now lost. He is sitting there alone, but his mind is busy and his brain hard at work. 
the sudden revulsion of feeling throughout the country, aroused by the discovery of the drowned body of Lord Westray and the tragic fate of Gloria Delara, coupled with the published declarations of Leone Stanley, and later on the startling dying depositions of Eric Fortescue, have all combined to create this reaction in favour of the Destrangeite party. The Devonsmere government, weak in composition and intellect, at once succumbed, and Lord Pandolph Chertsey, the freelance of the National Party, stepped into the Duke of Devonsmere's shoes. But Lord Pandolph was too clever and practical to attempt to govern the fiery steed of public opinion with mimic reins of power. He appealed to that tribunal which alone has the right to nominate its rulers, the people, and demanded of the country its mandate. And now the country, without demur or hesitation, has spoken out in no uncertain tone. The light of a pure and noble life has penetrated the darkness of opposition and prejudice, and has fulfilled the prophecy which in childhood Gloria de Lara predicted. The cause of right and justice has triumphed, and the reign of selfishness, greed, and monopoly has passed away. By a glorious majority, estrangism has won. The progressists are nowhere, and the nationals have returned mutilated in numbers. The Destrangeites, recruited by sixty additional seats, declared the country's will, and Evie Ravensdale, at the command of his sovereign, has formed a ministry, known under the name of the Second Destrangeite Cabinet. These changes have been rapid. Little more than a month has passed away since the death of Gloria de Lara resounded through the world and already the vision which her childhood's genius conjured up as she spoke to the waves of the blue Adriatic and predicted victory is on the eve of realization. For even as it had been her first act of power to bring in a bill for the complete emancipation of women, so is it Evie Ravensdale intention to do likewise. But the position is different. When Hector de Strange submitted his bill to the Commons, he knew that for many reasons it was doomed the first and foremost being that the country had not spoken, or pronounced unmistakably for or against the change. On this occasion there can be no misunderstanding, however, for the Parliament returned gives the Destrangeites a majority over the other parties in the House combined, and in plain words declares the will of the people. But there is just this difference again. Whereas the first bill was introduced to the Commons, the second, in virtue of Evie Ravensdale's rank, must make its debut in the Lords. Will this latter assembly accept it? It remains to be seen. Yet surely, in the face of the country's mandate, the peers will submit to the people's wishes. No wonder, then, that the brain of the young Premier is busy and hard at work. In three hours from now he will be submitting the bill to his peers, and appealing to them in the name of justice and right in the name of fairness and honesty, in the name of great deed, to breathe upon it the breath of life. Surely the victory which the child Gloria foretold, which the young genius foresaw, is now at length to be won. Ah, surely yes! My darling, he whispers softly, as the vision, which for a few brief moments has shone in the gleaming coals, passes away in the changing light thereof. My darling, would to God that you were here, would to God that I had the counsel of your clear brain, the courage of your strong heart to support me. Yet hear me, Gloria, and help me to keep my vow. Have I not sworn to dedicate my life to the great work which your noble genius conceived and sought to accomplish? And with God's help I will be the faithful servant of your great cause. So help me God." He rises as he speaks, and fixes his gaze on the painting above him. It almost seems to him as though the figure of Hector de Strange, portrayed therein, stands there in living life. He can hardly realize, as he looks at the beautiful face, that the spirit which made Gloria so noble in life does not animate it now. In the subdued light and the flickering gleam of the fire, the features look living and real. To Evie Ravensdale they bring high resolves and noble inspirations, which only the influence of that which is great and lofty can awaken. Estcourt is late in the house, 
too late to hear the whole of the Premier's speech. He has been delayed by business of pressing moment. About five o'clock in the afternoon, a telegram had been put into his hands, the contents of which had dazed and struck him well-nigh speechless. He could not summon courage to credit its contents. Recovering, however, from his surprise, his first impulse had been to seek his chief and lay the telegram before him. Second thoughts had decided him, however, on not doing so, and he had elected instead to send off a long telegram himself. This telegram bore reference entirely to the one which he had received, and was addressed to a friend in South America. During the remainder of the day, Estcourt had been anxiously and feverishly awaiting the reply. So important does he regard this reply that he continues to await it, and in the House of Lords, crowded by every active member belonging to it, he alone is absent. It is natural, therefore, that his absence should have caused both surprise and comment, especially as he is a prominent member of the Second Estrangeite Ministry. He has come in now, however, and his colleagues eye him curiously. They cannot help noticing the suppressed look of excitement in his face, and the eager, restless expression in his eyes. Estcourt's ordinary manner is so quiet and calm that these unusual symptoms are all the more noticeable and surprising. But the Duke is still speaking. Attention is soon again riveted on what he is saying, and Estcourt is enabled, at any rate, to hear the latter part of his speech whose persuasive eloquence and oratorical power amaze the house, Evie Ravensdale never before having been regarded but as a commonplace speaker, an orator of mediocre talent. "'On this solemn occasion,' he is saying as Estcourt comes in, "'I beseech of your lordships to cast aside the cloak of old prejudices and selfish monopoly, and obey the unmistakable will of the country, which has appointed a House of Commons pledged to carry this great act of human justice and reparation. I appeal to you to show on this occasion a true courage, worthy of men, and abolish for ever the statute-book those disabilities under which women are deprived of rights to which they are entitled by reason of their common humanity with man. The stale arguments of past days can no longer be advanced in opposition to this bill. The false and brutal pretexts which formerly were adopted to reason away the human rights of women can no longer be resorted to. Woman has triumphantly established the fact that her mental capacities are equal to man's, ay, and her physical powers of strength and endurance as well, where she has been given fair chances and fair play. There remains but one argument against the removal of her disabilities and the triumphant assertion of the principles of this bill. That one argument is selfishness. Men are unwilling in many instances to allow women whom they have held in subjection so long to assume a position of equality with themselves. These men object to remove the halo with which they have self-crowned themselves. They object, in fact, to share with women the good things of this earth. There is but one definition of this attitude of opposition, and that is selfishness, my lords, pure and unadulterated selfishness. But the time has come when this selfishness is too glaring and apparent to pass from sight, when it must be faced, fought with, and conquered. On its defeat depends not the welfare of man only, but the welfare and advance of the world. We have sought to rule against the laws of nature too long. We have sought, by artificial means, to keep the world going, and we have failed. What has the rule of man accomplished? The vain gratification of a few, the misery of millions and hundreds of millions. War has been invented to glorify men, to uphold dynasties loathed in many instances by the people. Vice and immorality rage for the gratification of the ruler man. Philanthropy exists to patch up the sores and abscesses brought about in society by his excesses. The starving, the criminal, the miserable are supported by taxes wrung from the people. Religion spreads abroad its thousands of arms, each one asserting its sole right to be. But the fact remains. 
War is spreading, crime increasing, immorality assuming giant proportions, misery, disease and wrongdoing growing mightier day by day, while the forces that could and would stay these horrors still wear the badge of slavery. I appeal to your lordships to face these facts and act upon them generously and courageously. From our midst a great and commanding figure has but lately passed away, one who began in childhood an heroic and courageous resistance to wrong, and who maintained that resistance through her all too short career. Gloria de Lara, in the person of Hector de Strange, triumphantly established the fact of woman's equality with man, and undeniably asserted the right of her sex to share with him in the government of the world. And I ask your lordships to consider in a generous manner the motives which first prompted the great heart of Gloria de Lara to do battle for her sex, and which ultimately strengthened its resolve to maintain the contest to the last. Was it not a dawning comprehension of the terrible wrong under which her mother had become an outcast in this world, shunned and despised by society at large? Did not Gloria de Lara recognize that in woman's unnatural position lay the root of the evil? Then, as she grew up, and personally made herself acquainted with the woes afflicting society, did she not struggle to remedy this position, recognizing therein the key to human suffering? I bear testimony to her life of patient, unwearying research amidst the suffering and slaving classes. This it was that gave her such a grasp of her subject, when, in the House of Commons, she sought to unveil to the members thereof the horrors that existed. The dream of her life was to be spared in order to carry great social measures of reform, but she recognized the fact that to do this effectually woman must first be placed on the level of equality with man. For this she struggled, for this she fought on against overwhelming odds. I need not dwell on the false and brutal charge which was brought against her, which forced her to disclose her sex, which condemned her to die, and which, when rescued by her own women guards, made her an outcast and a wanderer, and a felon in the eyes of the law. The falsity of this detestable lie has been abundantly proved in the discovery of the dead body of the man who ruined and blasted her mother's life, who brought about her own pathetic and irredeemable death. In her name I appeal for justice, and I confidently believe that I shall not appeal in vain. I desire that the division shortly to be taken shall seal the fate of the measure on behalf of victory or defeat. You have the voice of the country ringing in your ears, but high above that voice should sound the loud appeal, which a great and noble example sends forth, the appeal of the glorious dead." He sits down amidst a storm of applause, unusual in this august and dignified assembly. He hardly hears it. He takes no note of the varied scene around him. Evie Ravensdale sees before him the face of but one being, that being Gloria Delara. Is not her spirit near encouraging, upholding, and leading him on to victory? But he is awakened from his dream at the call of duty. The division is being taken at last, and all wait in breathless expectation for the result. The contents have it! By a majority of a hundred seven, the peers obey the country's mandate, and acknowledge the people's will as law. Gloria has triumphed. That which she predicted is realized, the vow which she made is accomplished. Ah, in this moment of victory, who would not wish her here, instead of in the cold arms of death? Of death? Silence is being called for, and Lord Estcourt is endeavouring to make himself heard. He is successful at last. I wish to explain to the house, he begins, why I was not in my place when my noble friend began his speech. My excuse will be acceptable to this house, I am sure. The fact is, I received a telegram containing startling intelligence, so startling that I conceived it to be a hoax. I took steps to ascertain the truth, 
and am satisfied of the authenticity of the first intelligence. I have to announce to your lordships the glorious news that Gloria de Lara is not dead. By God's almighty goodness she is alive, alive to witness the triumph of her cause. Truly, indeed, you may exclaim with me in accepting this wonderful intelligence, it is God's will, it is the hand of God. End of Book 3, Chapter 7book 3 chapter 8 of gloriana or the revolution of 1900 by lady florence dixie this librivox recording is in the public domain gloriana or the revolution of 1900 book 3 chapter 8 gloria de lara lives the words have rung far and wide o'er land and distant sea they have entered the homes of the great the cottages of the poor they have brought joy to millions of weary hearts, who know that while that great name breathes the breath of life, reform cannot die. Yes, Gloria lives, lives. But how? Have we not seen her in the clutch of death? We left her therein. We left her being borne down by the resistless, sucking whirlpool of the sinking smack as the massive trading steamer, which had cut clean through the frail bark, bore on its course. As she parted her hold of Leone, Gloria had clutched the sinking wreck with that strong and tenacious grip which the drowning alone can command. The lighter and severed portion of the wreck had been swept forward by an enormous wave, which carried with it likewise the body of Leone, supported on the crest of the sea by the life-belt which Gloria had tied around her. But the bright flashing light which had danced in Gloria's eyes ere she was borne downwards had searched from stem to stern the helpless, storm-tossed craft, and the anxious gaze of the man on the lookout had been able to detect those two frail human forms. As the shout of, Boat ahoy! had rung out through the shrieking storm, the steamer had crashed through her frail antagonist in the manner already described. But the skipper of the Maid of Glad Tidings, as such the steamer was named, was brave and humane. In spite of the storm, he had skillfully brought his vessel to the rescue. The electric light had swept the sea in search of the unlucky boat, and after a time a portion of her had been sighted, a helpless and dismantled wreck. Yet to that wreck a human form was clinging. A brave crew had manned the lifeboat, and with the true pluck of British seamen had fought against terrible odds to rescue that one lone helpless creature. They succeeded and amidst that black night and howling storm, another deed of heroism had silently written its tale upon the scrolls of British fame. And as Captain Rugland's gaze had first fallen on the rescued victim of the storm, he had started. He was a big powerful man, with a tender, kindly heart. When, therefore, he bent over the silent figure and raised it in his arms, bearing it below to his own cabin, his men only saw in this act another evidence of the skipper's kindly disposition. Yet in that brief glance Gloria de Lara had been recognized, for what devoted adherent of her cause who had ever looked upon her face could forget it. Surtees, not Captain Ruglan. A member of the Ruglan clan, he was also an out-and-out Destrangeite, nor was this the first time that he had been in the company of Hector Destrange but he knew that the once successful and powerful idol of society was now a hunted and doomed felon, with a large reward out for her apprehension. He knew that many of his crew were not Destrangeites, and that it might go hard with him and her if she were recognized. Thus had he borne her to his cabin, determined there to protect and shield her, and carry her to the faraway free shores of the Spanish main, whither the Maid of Glad Tidings was bound. Reaching it, Gloria's first act had been to wire to Speranza de Lara in North America and to Estcourt in England. As yet she had heard no tidings of the wonderful events which had led up to the triumph of her cause. But those tidings sped back to her along the electric wire, they came in the shape of a loving message of welcome from the man she loved. From Evie Ravensdale she learned how victory had crowned her efforts. From him came the tidings of great joy that her vow had been accomplished. 
Once more the vast crowd of London surges in the streets, a happy, joyous, good-humoured crowd nevertheless. Every house is gay with bunting and flags, and triumphal arches are in every street through which the procession will pass along. What procession? Why, is not this the day upon which Gloria Delara is to reach our shores, and is she not to be welcomed back and publicly honoured in the great hall of liberty, where, when last she stood, she was a condemned and hunted felon? The yacht Eileen has gone to meet her. It has joined the Colossus, in which Glory has made her passage from South America at the mouth of the Thames. The party on board the Eileen consists solely of Speranza Delara, Flora Desmond, and her child, a fine girl of seven years, together with Evie Ravensdale, Estcourt, Leone, and Rita Vernon. All, with the exception of Speranza, wear the white, gold-braided uniform of the White Guards Regiment of the Women Volunteers an organization which a royal proclamation has called back to life. The Colossus has yielded up its precious charge. As the cutter bears Gloria Delara away from the great war monster's side towards the white, graceful Eileen that awaits her, the cannon belch forth their parting salute and welcome in one breath. There, standing on the deck ready to grasp her hand in a deep and loving tenderness, with heartfelt gratitude for her wonderful deliverance, stand the two beings whom she loves most in the world, Speranza Delara and Evie Ravensdale. What human words could describe that meeting, for they thought her dead, and behold, she is there in living life. Tilbury docks are reached. The roar of distant cannon announce her arrival. There she stands on the yacht's bridge, with Evie Ravensdale by her side. As the crowd sways to and fro to catch a glimpse of her, the people see that she wears the white guard's uniform. The regiment is there to meet and welcome her. As she leaves the yacht, its band strikes up the beautiful march triumphant, the same which had welcomed her to the Hall of Liberty, when, as Hector de Strange, she had performed the opening ceremony. The milk-white steed which she had ridden on that occasion now awaits her in its trappings of white and gold. Never has horse been so groomed and petted as this one. In sight of the crowd she bids her mother a courteous and tender farewell, for Speranza has elected to drive straight to Montregui House, there to await her child's return. A brilliant, mounted throng await the former's coming. Many well-known faces are there, amongst which Gloria catches sight of those of Lady Manderton and Lancelot Trevor. Now she has mounted her milk-white charger, Saladin, and with Evie Ravensdale and Nigel Estcourt on her right, and Flora Desmond and Archie Douglasdale on her left, is riding slowly forward. In close attendance behind are Rita Vernon and Leonie Stanley. The latter's eyes are busy in the crowd, and seem to search the ranks forward as they ride along. The brilliant throng of mounted friends close in, the cheering of the crowd is deafening. It will be one long loud roar until the Hall of Liberty is reached. The way is kept by the women's volunteer regiments, and the order is perfect. As Gloria and Flora ride along, they catch glimpses of old, tried, true, and trusty friends among the ranks. Friends who in time of trouble stood by them, and labored lovingly to make easier the rugged path which they were then treading. It is a soul-inspiring sight. Many of the people have brought flowers with them, and, as the procession approaches, they cast them loosely in the air, out of which they descend in a shower of many colors to carpet the way along which Gloria must pass, with their bright and variegated bloom. The strains of the white guard's band, the glitter of their white and gold uniforms, the loud cheering of the enthusiastic crowds as the brilliant cavalcade moves along, is a sight which the onlooker is not likely to forget. It thrills the hearts of that vast woman world, assembled to do honor to the one who has worked for and who has won their emancipation. One long triumphal march, one uninterrupted scene of unchecked enthusiasm is the welcome accorded her from the docks to the Hall of Liberty. The sun is shining on the gilded statues and million panes which crown that wondrous structure, as she approaches the building her genius conceived and raised, approaches it no longer as the hunted felon upon whose head the price of gold is set, but as a free woman, a victorious general, 
who has conquered the demon armies of monopoly and selfishness, and thrown open to the people the free gates of happiness and reform. Now through the giant portal she rides once more. Great God, what a burst of welcome, and what a scene! From floor to ceiling the monster building is crammed. Every available space has been occupied. There is not a foot of standing room. She has uncovered, and they see her face as she rides round the circular ride towards the huge platform, the same face of exquisite beauty which they remember and know so well. As she dismounts, she is received by the chairman of the committee appointed to carry out the day's proceedings, and to present the people's address of welcome, to which thousands of representative names from every county have been attached. On the platform are gathered every member of the ministry, and every distrangeite member of Parliament. Truly a royal welcome by staunch and faithful friends. For, as Gloria dismounts and steps upon the platform, she is greeted with a loud long cheer by these men of generous mould, who have fought so nobly on behalf of her holy cause. All honour be to them for ever. Sir Arthur Hazelrig, Lord Mayor of London, presents and reads the address of welcome, and as he concludes it, Gloria Delara stands forward to reply. An intense silence falls. All are eager to hear again a voice which they had believed to be forever stilled in death. "'My friends,' she begins, and though the voice has all the clear, ringing sweetness of yore, there is undoubtedly a tremor in it. "'It would require a special language, one of which we have yet no knowledge, to convey to you the emotions which this scene of magnificent welcome awakens within me. From the bottom of my heart I thank you for it, as well as all those true and gallant friends who have created this glorious day. For next to God it is the people who have created it. In this welcome which you have given to me, the humble and all too unworthy representative of a magnificent cause, the great principle of human freedom is at length recognized, that freedom inherited at birth, and only wrung from individuals by oppression and wrong. Human freedom means the right to take part in the creation of laws for the better government and perfection of man. It means that man and woman are born equal, are created to work hand in hand for the greater happiness of mankind. Hitherto this principle of mighty truth has not been recognized, with the awful results shown forth in man's ever-increasing degradation. By the acknowledgment of this principle you have laid the train which, when fired, will put an end to immorality and social wrongs, which will make evil unpleasant to perform, and which will degrade the performer to the position of a leper, the shunned and outcast of society, loathed and despised by his fellow-men. By the acknowledgment of this principle a day of darkness has sunk to rise no more, and one of brightness and promise and fair hope has arisen to cheer us along the glorious path of reform. Much there is to be done, mountains of prejudice and selfishness and greed yet to be faced and conquered. But the army which the acknowledgment of human freedom has raised is an army which will fight victoriously to the end. For it is an army in which men and women will do battle side by side, and shoulder to shoulder, undeterred by class jealousies or the odious assumption of superiority by one sex over another. My friends, as I stand today in this Hall of Liberty and look upon this magnificent scene, memories rise up before me of a stirring and eventful past. I see before me now a picture which in childhood I loved to imagine, a glorious reality which in the past haunted my waking dreams. On many incidents of that past I would prefer not to dwell, arousing, as they must, the bitterness of human nature. Rather is the province of the conqueror, of the victorious to forgive and forget, to look forward to the future and strive for the possibilities which that future may contain. We are starting along a new path in life, a path open to all, not monopolized by the few, a path which, as time goes on, shall show traces of victory on all sides. 
I ask the great army of my countrymen to endeavour to win those victories as speedily as possible, so that in the future the day may dawn when there shall be no misery, no wickedness, no crime. In that army women now find a place. Let them triumphantly prove their right to be there. They have yet an uphill road to climb, but I have confidence that they will compass it, and now that the gates of freedom are thrown open to them, take part in all the great deeds of the world. Upon them the eyes of this world will be fixed. Upon them depends the ultimate freedom of the human race. I have no fear as to the result. I do not for one moment dread the trial. I believe, moreover, that the presence and natural companionship of woman will upraise and influence man's character for good, banishing from his daily life those coarser habits which self-indulgence and lack of moral influence have allowed to creep therein, and that society, in its remodeled state, will thus be enabled to deal with the evils which infest it. My friends, I need detain you no longer. On my arrival in this country, I was informed that my old constituency had re-elected me as its member. I rejoice to hear that I have several women fellow-members in the legislature to whom men, generous and noble-hearted men, have relinquished places. To tell you that the remainder of my life, which God has so mercifully spared to me, will be employed in working for the people, in devoting every energy I possess to their advancement, is the sum of my declaration here to-day. Rest assured that, for them, no one will struggle harder than Gloria Delara. A simple speech, a quiet, honest declaration. Though she stands there, the cynosure of all eyes, there is no vanity or conceit in those few simple words. Gloria's aim is unveiled. It is the upraising and triumph of humanity. She lives but to work on its behalf. She is on the point of stepping back amidst a perfect hurricane of cheers, when Evie Ravensdale comes to her side. "'One moment, Gloria. Stay where you are,' he whispers. "'I have something to say.' He raises his hand to ask for silence, and the people accord it to him. "'My friends,' he exclaims, for with Gloria Delara may I not call you my friends? I have a pleasing task to perform in that which I am going to say. As Gloria Delara has told you, the law of this country has at length acknowledged the principle of human freedom, and woman's right to equal man is finally recognized. When the country spoke out so unmistakably on behalf of human freedom, my sovereign bade me assume the reins of power. I accepted them, not unwillingly, for the only object I had in life was to carry out the great reforms which the genius of Gloria Delara had conceived, and of which she had made me the confidant. At that time I believed, with all others, that she was dead. But, my friends, she is alive. And now I tell you that she only has a right to assume the reins confided to me. She alone has the right to carry those great reforms. The person who conceived them alone has that right, and I, her deputy, relinquish it to her. I tell you that Gloria Delara must be your Prime Minister, while I will take my part as a humble worker with the people. With the full approval of my colleagues and every Distrangeite member, I intend forthwith to tender my resignation and to advise my sovereign to send for Gloria Delara. There can be no mistaking the genuine ring of approval in the mighty cheer that bursts forth from the thousands of throats in that densely packed building. Truly, the child's heartfelt prayer has been answered in this splendid tribute paid to her unselfish labors, from the days of childhood far into those of womanhood. End of Book Three, Chapter Eight Book Three, Chapter Nine of Gloriana, or The Revolution of Nineteen Hundred, by Lady Florence Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gloriana, or The Revolution of Nineteen Hundred, Book Three, Chapter Nine. 
wealth and magnificence rear their forms in and around the precincts of St. Stephen's. They do not, however, monopolize the entire space, for here and there the squalid streets of poverty abide, with all their wealth and magnificence of suffering, crime, and sin. One of these streets is just across the river, and the clock in the big tower of the Houses of Parliament can peep and peer therein, even from its misty height. Staring from a dust-begrimed window on the second floor of a dirty-looking dwelling situated in the street named, stands a woman whose rough, untidy hair is tied back in a knot, and whose coarse, seared features show signs of former enamelling now disused. Poor wretch! There is hunger and misery in her eyes, and despair as well. Some would say insanity gleams there. She is listening to the cannon's roar as they belch forth their welcome to Gloria Delara. Their booming sound is maddening to the hungry, lonely, despairing woman, who stands there with not a friend in the world. Yes, he has forsaken her, got away scot-free himself, but left her to wait for and look for him in vain. Victoire Hester has parted with her jewelry and tawdry finery for a mere song, the five-pound note which Mr. Trackham gave her is expended, and she has not a farthing left in the world. Tomorrow she must find three shillings for the rent of her miserable, unhealthy room, and she has not got it, nor has a morsel of food touched her lips this day. She is broken-hearted. Worse than that, she is jealous, angry, bitter. It maddens her to think of Gloria at the pinnacle of success and she who sought to assist in her ruin at the bottom of the abyss of abject misery. What is left to her in the world? Nothing. Her character is gone. She cannot find work, and if she could, she would not undertake it. She has no heart to do anything, for in her coarse, hard way she loved Trackham, loved him only to lose him. Whose fault but hers? she mutters angrily as the cannon boom once more. Why should she be happy, while I die here like a dog? Not that I want to live, I mean to die. But she shan't live to be happy, that she shan't. I'll send her first, and then I'll go myself. Ha, ha! Surely insanity rings in that voice. Poor Victoire! You do not know how lovingly Gloria would forgive you if she only knew the state you were in, how eagerly she would seek to raise you from that fallen state and set you on the straight path once more. But all this you do not know. She goes over to a tumble-down looking chest of drawers that has seen better days, and pulls open one of the drawers. Out of this she takes a six-chambered bulldog revolver, examines it carefully, and slips it into her pocket. It used to belong to Mr. Trackham, and she had brought it away with her when she left the house in Verdigris Crescent, a few hours after the departure of Inspectors Truffle and Bush. She has kept it by her. It is about the only thing she has not parted with, vaguely feeling that it may be useful, if Mr. Trackham does not answer her piteous appeals in the agony columns of the Times. For Victoire Hester has determined to put an end to herself now that he has forsaken her. The rich and well-clothed may condemn her, but who could, who, diving into the arid desert of that lonely hopeless heart, beheld the mortal wound inflicted by despair? The revolver safe, she next unearths an old woolen shawl, which she flings over her head and pins under her chin. Then she is ready, and she gropes her way down the dark staircase into the street. She is hungry, weary, and weak, but she walks briskly along, looking straight ahead of her. People are hurrying across Westminster Bridge, eager to get a good place in the line along which Gloria Delara will pass on her way from the Hall of Liberty to Montregui House. Victoire Hester is intent on securing a good place, too. And she is successful. She takes her stand in Whitehall, not a stone's throw from the Duke of Ravensdale's mansion. She will have a long time to wait, but she steels herself to endure it. Denser and denser grows the throng, but Victoire Hester, though pushed and hustled about, nevertheless maintains her position in the front rank. She feels she must hold that at any cost. It is necessary for her purpose. There is a tremor in the crowd, as if an electric current had passed through it. 
now the boom of cannon resounds once more. These warning notes tell the people that the ceremony is over in the Hall of Liberty, and that Gloria de Lara is leaving it for Montregui House. A hum runs along the serried walls of human forms. The electric current is apparently again at work. From afar, strains of martial music come floating to the people's ears, arousing them to the pitch of expectancy and excitement. There is a dull continuous roar, too. It never seems to cease, as it rises and falls like the waves of a turbulent sea, breaking upon the wild shores of a rock-bound coast. Yet as it comes nearer, the roar assumes a human sound. It is that of thousands and tens of thousands of voices cheering lustily. Victoire Hester's trembling hand gropes in her pocket for the revolver. She knows now that Gloria de Lara is approaching, and that the moment which will close her own life is at hand. Yes, surely, insanity is writ in those eyes as they stare hungrily forward. How terribly they gleam! No one notices her, however. Every eye is bent upon the approaching procession. There comes the band of the White Guards, how soul-stirring its music! And there, too, is the milk-white charger Saladin, with arching neck and proud carriage, for does he not bear a precious charge indeed in the person of Gloria de Lara? The sun gleams down upon her gilded helmet, and lights with a living blaze the gold braiding upon her uniform. How beautiful she looks as she rides along with the glance of eager thousands upon her! How she loves the people! How they return that love! Surely none in that wildly enthusiastic crowd would seek to harm her! Yes, one would, though, and we know who. The madness in Victoire Hester's brain is increased by the scene before her. More than ever she questions the right of this woman to be happy, to be the idol of thousands while she is doomed to be friendless and miserable. Will no one stay her hand? Will no one arrest and strike down the engine of death which she is steadily raising and bringing to bear full on Gloria's breast? Ah, can no one in this moment of wild excitement see the danger that threatens the idol of the people? See, Victoire's finger is on the trigger. God, can no one see and stay it? Yes, one can see it though she cannot stay it, one whose glance has faithfully swept the crowd ahead of Gloria all the way along. Only a pair of dark gray faithful eyes, with a wondrous wealth of lashes shading their intelligent depths, only a girl in years, yet with the light of genius stamped on the beautiful forehead above them. She sees and recognizes Victoire Hester in spite of her changed aspect and the mad look in her eyes. Leone Stanley sees the revolver raised and the assassin's finger on the trigger. Deep into her horse's flanks she drives her spurs. He springs furiously forward, brushes roughly against Saladin and his rider, and covers like a shield the person of Gloria de Lara. Only just in time, though. The revolver's note rings forth, speeding from its lips the messenger of death. Yet another note, and it claims two victims for its own. One is a wild, pale, haggard woman stretched out upon the street, from whose temple blood is flowing, the other a young officer of the White Guards Regiment, who has fallen forward on the grey neck of her horse, and whose blood is staining his dappled, well-groomed coat. Dear little Leone has not lived in vain. She has proved her love and gratitude at last. She has shown how ill-fitting was the cloak of Judas in which the wicked had striven to clothe her. She has lived to prove her gratitude and is faithful unto death. End of Book Three, Chapter Nine. Book Three, Chapter Ten of Gloriana, or the Revolution of Nineteen Hundred, by Lady Florence Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gloriana, or the Revolution of Nineteen Hundred. Book Three, Chapter Ten. 1999. It is a lovely scene on which that balloon looks down, a scene of peaceful villages and well-tilled fields, a scene of busy towns and happy working people, a scene of peace and prosperity, comfort and contentment, which only a righteous government could produce and maintain. 
the balloon is passing over London, a London vastly changed from the London of 1900. Somehow it wears a countrified aspect, for every street has its double row of shady trees, and gardens and parks abound at every turn. This London, unlike its predecessor, is not smoke-begrimed, nor can it boast of dirty courts and filthy alleys like the London of 1900. Every house, great and small, bears the aspect of cleanliness and comfort, for poverty and misery are things no longer known. A stranger in the balloon looks down with interest upon this scene. His gaze, wandering across the mighty city, is arrested by two gleaming gilded statues crowning a monster edifice, upon whose cap of glittering panes the sun is shining brightly. "'Is that the Hall of Liberty?' he inquires of his guide. "'Yes,' answers the person addressed. "'The same was raised a century ago by the great Duchess of Ravensdale of noble memory.' "'Is she buried there?' asks the stranger dreamily. "'Buried there? Ah, no!' replies the man almost indignantly. "'I thought all the world knew where glory of Ravensdale sleeps. There is a beautiful grave overlooking the Atlantic Ocean, on the shores of Glenig Bay. It is there where Gloria sleeps, by the side of her husband, Evelyn, the good Duke of Ravensdale. It was her wish, and her wish with the nation was law. Every year the grave is resorted to by thousands, who lay upon it their tributes of lovely flowers." "'Is anyone else buried there?' again the stranger asks. "'Yes, sir, a great woman, Lady Flora Desmond. She survived glory of Ravensdale for many years, and carried on her noble works of reform. She was Prime Minister for twenty years, and her last request was to be buried at the feet of the Duke and Duchess of Ravensdale." The Ravensdales owned immense wealth, and parted with it all, so history says, murmurs the stranger. Ay, sir, they gave it all to the poor. At least they spent it on the poor, and by their noble example induced others to do likewise," answers the man. There is no poverty in this country now, sir. As we pass across it you will see evidence of peace and contentment, and plenty everywhere. We owe it all to the glorious reforms of glory of Ravensdale." "'That is a very lovely garden not far from Westminster Bridge which you lately pointed out to me,' continued the stranger. "'What a glorious wealth of flowers! Ah, that, sir, is where Leonie Stanley saved Gloria de Lara from assassination by a maniac. But she lost her life in doing so. She was accorded a public funeral, and by the wish of the nation buried where she fell. The garden was laid out afterwards. It is the nation's pride to keep it beautiful. Leonie's heroic deed will forever live in the hearts of a grateful people. And where is the great Lord Estcourt buried? in the National Burial Ground, where only those whom the nation loves to honour are laid." "'Yonder splendid building is the Imperial Parliament, is it not?' pursues the stranger. "'Yes, sir. That is where the representatives of our federated empire watch over its welfare. To glory of Ravensdale we owe the triumph of Imperial Federation. She lived long enough to see England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales peacefully attending to their private affairs in their local parliaments while sending delegates to represent them in the Imperial Assembly. Ah, sir, that Imperial Assembly is a wonderful sight. Therein we see gathered together representative men and women from all parts of our glorious empire, working hand in hand to spread its influence amongst the nations of the world, with all of whom we are at peace." The balloon is rapidly drifting northwards. As the shades of evening begin to creep on apace it moves along Scotland's western coasts. The aeronaut in charge of it guides it above the graves of Evie and Gloria Ravensdale and Lady Flora Desmond. As the sun goes down across the western sea it bathes, with a farewell flood of glory, the last resting place on this earth of the great deed. The balloon descends, guided by a skillful hand. It soon reaches the ground, and in a short time the stranger stands by these graves. Three simple marble hearts lie above them on which are engraved in golden letters the names of those who sleep below. And at the head of the graves a marble cross is standing with a few simple words thereon. The stranger goes over to the cross and reads, Sacred to the memory of Gloria de Lara, 
Duchess of Ravensdale. The mighty champion of women's freedom and the savior of her people, and also to that of Evelyn, the good Duke of Ravensdale, and the beloved and revered Lady Flora Desmond. Their names are engraved in the hearts of millions, now and for all time. Amen." Surely Gloria had triumphed. What greater reward did she hope for than the welfare and love of the people? Maremna's Dream A soft wind sweeps across Maremna's form. She starts and springs from off her heathery couch. It was a dream, and yet not all a dream. For scenes which in her wandering she's beheld have thronged that vision. She has seen again that which has crossed her in the paths of men, that which has taught her life's reality. Yet deep within, Maremna's soul is stirred by that bright vision of a fight well won, a gleam of hope that yet these things shall be, that freedom shall not ever droop and pine, but strike a blow for glorious liberty. A waking vision to Maremna's soul, yet none the less inspiring, for the gleam which first awoke within her mightier half has glowed and burnt into a fervent flame, which none but God can ever extinguish. A blood-red sunset. Bathed in its glow Maremna stands alone, alone where oft in childhood she has played. The vision before her is bright and clear. Lo, it awakes her from a living trance, bids her arise and buckle on her mail. Far off she hears the busy din of war, and knows that duty calls her to the fray. In that brief hour Maremna's vow is made. Lo sinks the sun, and gloom o'erspreads the earth, as down the rugged mountainside she wends her way. Maremna's high resolve is taken, faithful till death to be, unto her vow. The End of Gloriana, or The Revolution of 1900 by Lady Florence Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.